propensity to have a fear of public speaking. All right. So, sorry. no worries. So, right. I'm going to share this resource at the end. So don't worry about having to capture the, the title, the talk, or frantically type into YouTube or anything in the background. So one of my favorite talks about dispelling charisma and stage fright is one that was given by the comedian Deborah Francis White. And it was given at TEDx Cambridge a few years ago. And she basically talks about kind of spinning that evolutionary idea on its head a bit. Instead, she talks about the idea of the savannah and that public speaking, guess where the top titles came from, public speaking is a fear of being eaten. This idea that there's a pack of hungry lions, aka the audience that is glaring at you as you speak, and you're that frightened gazelle that is worried that you're effectively lunch. It feels like a very rational response. No one really wants to be lunch, like let's be honest here. And for a very long time, and sometimes in little bits in between, I'll be honest, I've definitely had moments where I felt like a gazelle, that I was like a deer in headlights, no idea what was going on, and was really scared about the audience potentially being critical of what I had to say, calling me out, saying I wasn't an expert, that things were wrong, or worse, well, not really being eaten. The worst that's going to happen is someone's going to criticise what I have to say. So... I am here to say that it is a big journey to get into public speaking and tech. Tech as well has some particular challenges, but I'm going to use my experience to show you that everyone on this call today can also be a public speaker. So the first thing I wanna say is we need to forget our past bad experiences. I'm pretty sure everyone on this call today can think of a time in school, in their work, perhaps when they were at college or university, of a time when they had to do some form of kind of oral report in front of a class. And it was one of the most horrible things. And you still now are probably thinking very vividly about that moment, thinking, I don't want to do that actively for fun or for interest. Like, no, I'm not doing that. I think part of the reason that we hate public speaking is because in school, it is not taught well. So, my original path into public speaking started when I was in primary school, when I was about five years old. I was one of the people that was doing the reading to explain the nativity story of the nativity play um, as part of the nativity at Christmas. That is public speaking, if you think about it. Um, and I had done a few other things like that in front of the class, if you think about school assemblies and things since. But then see when you go to high school, and you start taking a step back because you don't want to ask questions. You don't want to be laughed at if you get it wrong. You don't want to be laughed at because you're standing at the front of the class and you say a word wrong or you stutter. I think for me and for a lot of us probably on this call, we have that vivid image and think, I can't do public speaking. I can't, you know, subject myself to ridicule. It's a very natural reaction, to be perfectly honest, you know, it's a protective mechanism. But I had another problem because in addition to stepping away at that point, I didn't do much of it at university either. So a quick show of hands, how many of us are from a computer science or a, an engineering or STEM background? Okay, got a few, yeah. So I am as well, uh, my background is software engineering. And I didn't do many presentations and oral reports. Did anybody else? <laughs> Not really. Uh, yeah, most of our submissions, if you think about it, were submitting code samples or for maths classes, obviously submitting solutions to exercises or writing reports. And that doesn't put you in a better stead either. It means that as you progress through your educational career, you don't really want to do public speaking again. And then the same thing happened to me again. My first postgraduate job, I was a software developer. I wrote code. I wrote emails. I would sit in a room, but generally I would be part of the pride. I would be amongst you know, clients or peers, a group that we were all talking about a solution together. I wasn't the forefront. 
But what changed it was when I moved into my first front end developer job when I was doing web. And one of the things that was really interesting was we'd moved to start working in a more agile way. So we were practicing Scrum. And email before, because I'd worked in a regulatory role, we all thought at that time you couldn't do regulatory projects without waterfall. I hadn't any experience of it. And one of the things that I found interesting was as the front end web developer, I ended up being the person that was doing the demos as part of the review to showcase the new features on a regular basis. And that is a form of presenting. And I used to hate it. It didn't matter if it was on the phone. It didn't matter if we were sitting in a room huddled around people. At that point, you're the center of attention. And all these things are examples of presentation skills. We might not think about them as explicit as that. We think it's got to be in front of a large room of people, either virtual like just now or in a big conference room. And the reality is that actually, without thinking about it, we are doing some form of public speaking. So it's an important aspect of our jobs, even before we think about the ideas of sharing knowledge and all the other things we want to do to grow the next generation of talented technologists. One of the things I thought when I started trying to do conference speaking and speaking at meetups is that it was too late. I'd miss my shot. So as I said, I started doing this run about three years ago. The pandemic is not a good time to start learning how to do public speaking because of course everything was online. <laughs> but for a long time before that, I didn't even think about it. I thought public speaking was something that I would just go through and I would do it whenever I needed to and I wouldn't be able to enjoy it. And that was it. I wouldn't put myself forward for conferences. I was just happy doing the review, de the review demos, that's it. I focused on other things. I focused on promotion. Many of us sit and think about milestones to showcase expertise, to gain experience in leadership and management so that we can progress to that level. And I spent the, the majority of my initial time doing that. I also ended up having some personal aspirations that I wanted to do. I went off and I had my son who is three and definitely keeps me busy to this day. And I thought when I came back from maternity and leave, with a busy home life and a busy work life that I wouldn't be able to fit speaking at meetups and conferences in the evenings or potentially on weekends or during the day with my busy work schedule. I didn't think I could do that. I thought I'd missed my shot. I thought it wasn't something that I could do now, that basically I needed to make sure that I worked nine to five so I could pick up and drop off the little one and that was it. And the reality is that that is not true. It makes it harder because Fitting in these things requires probably a bit more time management skills than I would like to admit, but it's still doable. It just means that you need to take smaller steps, you need to take your time, and you need to think about the ways that you can fit it in without burning yourself out, because this is effectively getting into a side hustle game. But that wasn't one of the bigger challenges. One of the biggest challenges that stopped me for a long time, even thinking about public speaking, I didn't see many people that looked like me doing this. I would go to conferences in tech and I wouldn't see that. The biggest one was actually in my work setting. So as we said in my intro, I used to work in investment bank as a technologist. Does anyone work in banking or a large corporate entity at all? Yeah, that's fine, that's okay. So. Despite the fact I was a software developer, all of our town halls and a lot of our sessions were what you would expect, really formal. Basically, a bunch of guys in suits. In case you haven't noticed, that is not me. <laughs> With curly hair and brightly colored blazers, that is definitely not me. So, and I don't have the executive presence and perfect poise and the ability to not put ums in my sentences when I speak. So you think that, it's not the kind of thing you should be doing because you don't fit that stereotype. And then when I went to tech conferences, it was slightly better. There was people that were probably more relatable, but most of them were wearing hoodies and jeans. Most of them were men as well. And it's really difficult as well because I'm not that either. I also don't consider myself to be an expert as a front end developer. I tend to talk myself down and talk about being a jack of all trades. One of the hardest things that we have to do as women is sometimes we need to be the role model that we want to see. 
And that's really hard because it means stepping out of your comfort zone in a really big way. And fundamentally, that's kind of what I had to do. And I think everyone on this call can do that as well. And I'm sure you're doing it in ways that you don't even realize today. So not all heroes wear capes. You know, sometimes it's just someone taking a step up and saying, I can do this. And by someone saying that means that it is visible to others and therefore more people are more likely to say, you know what, I'm going to give it a try. I'm going to submit for that lightning talk or I'm going to submit for that CFP. So I really struggled with figuring out, one, if I was an expert and two, if I had anything interesting to say or anything useful to say. And a big part of that actually was around to the size of the, the gap I had in being hands-on and technical, what we would call technical. So for up until my promotion, I was very hands-on. I was a developer, I was writing tons of code. And then I started progressing more into kind of like a team lead position. I was doing more mentoring and I was writing less code. And then I took a break to have my son. And I ended up in a situation where I probably went almost two and a half years without writing very much code, more, probably more configuration and, and review, more reading and reviewing than actually writing it. And that meant it was really scary to go and say, I am able to submit to a conference or I'm able to even write about my experience because I thought no one's going to be interested in that. But the reality is that we are all a cup of knowledge. We have experiences, we have nuances, we have knowledge based on our own career journeys and everything we're doing every day that is actually useful to other people, not just people coming down before, after us, you know, in terms of the next generation that we want to hold the door open to, but also to other people in other domains that might want to be making a switch, that maybe haven't used that technology or that process or that tool or that technique. So therefore your knowledge is invaluable and sharing even the slightest chunk of it is useful. So I say that I only got into speaking three years ago, but I actually started doing blogging earlier. And the reason I did was because I didn't feel comfortable going and speaking because I had a fear of public speaking and I hated it. And I wanted to find another way to, to share. And it was actually an intern. So one of the best examples I have about reverse mentoring and learning from people that are not, you know, in your seniority is someone telling, an intern telling me, why don't you write about your knowledge? Because it's, it's helped me so much and it's going to help other people. And actually blogging is a good way to start or tweeting, writing content, writing something is a really good way to start because it helps you focus a message. It's a safer way of sharing your knowledge in a way because you are not speaking, you're not having to deal with the stage fright and the other attributes that we all love about public speaking. You can just sit and you can write something in the comfort of your home, perhaps come back to it when you've got time and eventually you can publish it. I started doing it on Medium just because it meant I didn't need to worry about building a website or showcasing off my front end flair or feeling bad that I was gonna end up using WordPress anyway. I just wanted to get the content out of there. But I got tons of great feedback from colleagues. I got to connect with people outside of my organization. One of the things that's interesting when you work in the same company for so long is your network is very heavy on that company. So I was able to diversify and, and meet other people this way. And then when I was ready, I could make my brand a bit more front and centre. So when I started applying for advocate jobs, I would actually just, um, I put it on my own personal blog as well. And I did use WordPress. It's a bit of a secret. Well, it's not now, is it? Um, but, you know, being able to fit, is, the content is more important. Not necessarily about, you know, having to build the most amazing website and learn all the technologies behind it. The content is really the important bit when you're starting to get something out there to share your knowledge. And the most minor thing that you can think of is useful to somebody. So it's definitely worth giving it a try if you're maybe not ready to speak yet. But there's other resources that I used to try and get there and workshops is one of them. So this might seem like a strange thing to say, but 
actually learning about the process that conferences have for proposals for how you submit a talk, how you get accepted, how you write an abstract, never mind the public speaking bit, all that other process around things is quite daunting as well. And when I decided I wanted to do public speaking, when I was just coming back from maternity leave, the first thing I did was take the Saturday before I went to work um, and went to Global Diversity CFP Day. These haven't come back post pandemic, sadly, but there are workshop alternatives. And basically what they covered in this session was an overview of how you submit to conferences. They did a workshop that helped you write an abstract. So figuring out how to write, you know, a short description of your talk and what it's what it's going to cover. And it talks about other useful things as well. So obviously you want to be speaking to inclusive communities such as this one, as we saw with the code of conduct at the start. So you want to make sure you're using inclusive language. They had other sessions to give you tips on that too. I've also used the aspiring speakers, so not these particular ones, but I've used similar workshops to try, particularly when I pivoted to doing technical talks and was scared about talking through code. Um, but you can check out, see if you can find available sessions for how to prepare and create a short talk in under 15 minutes. And they do other sessions as well. So if you're interested, I'll share the link on how to join these communities at the end. And you can keep an eye out for the workshops if you're interested in learning more about how to build a talk and um, how to find your topic and dispelling a lot of that idea that you don't have anything interesting to say, because we all have something interesting to say. You need mentors. Obviously, there's the mentor group attached to Women Who Code. And I ended up having a mentor in my situation as well, because despite going through those workshops, despite going to Global Diversity CFP Day and coming away being so pumped that I was going to do speaking, immediately that lag, that feeling of being a gazelle came back. You know, those things of how you're not going to be able to fit this in with a full time job and a kid at home or you've not got anything interesting to say or you will be able to, to manage all of this. Um, definitely was hanging around. And it was actually a mentor, Jim, that I had, who was just someone that worked in the same company that I did, that I knew had done conference speaking before. I didn't need a formal program. I just went and spent some time with him and asked for some help, asked for questions. And he was really helpful in dispelling a lot of these myths. He actually told me how he found it juggling things like travel and other considerations for conferences, for things like that. He watched my first lightning talk before I even gave it to give me some pointers. He reviewed abstracts, all of these things. He was absolutely vital, so much help. And we need mentors, not just for technical skills, not just for general career development, but for other skills such as speaking too, because they can do other things like connect us to communities that can help because it takes a village. It really does in order to learn how to public speak because you're worried about if you've got enough information on that topic, you're worried about researching, all the other misnomers I've talked about before are all there. It's really hard. And then you have to grapple trying to explain technical concepts, which can feel really scary and daunting as well. And I would not be here if it weren't for some communities that I basically used to I went to their sessions to see how other people spoke. I went along to workshops that they were doing. I went along to sessions where they talked about things like how to pick topics, tips from other speakers. I went to all these things and got tons of tips, knowledge, resources along the way. I gave my first lightning talk at the London Java community, despite not being a Java developer, I will dabble in backend services when I need to. But that's not my happy place. So you might think that you have to stick to the, the communities that you are automatically associated with. But the reality is that there might be others, particularly if you want to talk around topics around softer skills, things like code reviews, other processes and techniques. That's something that's applicable irrespective of technology, irrespective of programming language. And it's very inclusive. So don't just immediately dismiss these types of communities. 
obviously I'd encourage anyone who wants to join aspiring women speakers and aspiring speakers to do so. Aspiring speakers runs lunchtime lightning talks every two weeks and I still do them occasionally. It's a lot of fun. It's a good way to practice. It's a good way to refine content and try and hone your message when you're building a new talk. So I recommend those. And then I've put Toastmasters down, not because I have done Toastmasters, but I have former colleagues that have done it. Some companies do have Toastmasters associated with them, might have a group internally. There's tons of Toastmasters across London, across the UK, across the world as well. If you like a more formal approach, then obviously you can give that a go too. And it's worth saying as well that the other communities I've talked about are not specific to London. You're of course welcome to join no matter where in the world that you are. The next thing I want to talk about is the idea of building up your milestones. So just like we would break a big problem into smaller pieces with technologists or by anyone working in the IT industry, you need to break up the problem of learning to speak as well. Because it's a summit with loads of small peaks along the way. And it's going to feel sometimes like you can't make it over the next one. I found various different axes that I needed to build up in order to get comfortable with speaking. The first was the length. So I'm speaking for about 30, 35 minutes today, probably in the middle. The first talk I did was five minutes long. And I remember it vividly. I was sitting down in my chair. My legs would not stop shaking. I had this feeling that my voice was going nuts. And that was even after I'd done a trial run with Jim. And the reality is that I felt it went really bad, but everyone else was telling me that it went really good. It's a lot of things that people think about that you think is obvious and are, are noticeable that people just shrug off because it's not, it's not important. What's important is the message and the knowledge that you take away from when someone's speaking. So started with lightning talks. So I then built it up to 25 minute slots. This was all online this point because it was during the pandemic that I learned to speak and the uh, crowds was not, was not a good idea. And then built up eventually to 45 minute, 50 minute slots as well. And these include, well, minus the lightning talk, the, the slots for meetups and conferences will normally include Q&A unless stated otherwise. So that's a useful thing to note. Sometimes you're like, oh, do I include Q&A or not? Um, generally they include it. But if you're not sure, always ask if you're submitting and conferences are always happy. They'll put disclaimers. They'll give all sorts of help to first time speakers if you do, if you ask. So it's definitely worth, worth knowing about that. The other aspect was the format. So I talked about the idea of doing demos towards the start and that was all over the phone because we didn't have webcams and we, we all joined over onto conference calls. And then I did all my speaking through like this over Zoom. But then in the end, I'd gravitated to in-person and that online to in-person was one of the scariest jumps I had. Not the scariest, but one of the scariest. Because I went from doing meetups quite happily online to doing a meetup in person. It was in a bar. They had these huge lights bearing down on me. I had a microphone in my hand for the first time because I had, was used to headphones. Um, I'd had issues with connectors. All these little things make you more nervous, never mind the fact that you now are able to see the eyes and it's not just little boxes anymore. So that definitely was something that I needed to step up to. And I'm glad I stepped up to doing a meetup in person before I then went to a conference in person, which is exactly this final idea here. But the other thing that I did that people might not think about is the topic. You need to be comfortable with the topic. So I talked about that gap I had for a few years where I didn't write any code. And as a result, I was terrified about giving what I would consider a technical talk, i.e. a talk on a framework or um, about you know, JavaScript or something like that. So I started with tech learning because it was relevant. I could use my experience of trying and failing to keep up to date on maternity leave as part of that. But then when I got back to work and I was doing more Scrum Master responsibilities, agility and submitting to Lean Agile conferences was more of a natural fit. And these are all still valid. You can switch between them depending on the 
domain of your talk, the domain of your interest. And then when I did decide, hey, I want to go back and be a contributor again. I want to write code. You know, I'm, I'm, I want to get back to the nitty gritty. At that point, combined with the workshop, I then felt I was comfortable enough to talk through what is about technologies and frameworks. Because one of the biggest misnomers I thought is that you needed to have just lines and lines of code dotted through your slides for it to be classed as a technical talk. And it's not. We can talk about processes, we can talk about culture. Most conferences have a culture track associated with them, particularly DevOps UK, which is a great conference. So it's definitely worth thinking about, you know, it doesn't need to be code littered through the entire thing in order for it to be a technical talk. But you need to give the audience air, you know? Think about if you someone's talking you through code for 30, 40 minutes. You're probably you might be falling asleep by the end, but you'll definitely feel the brain drain surface. So it's okay to kind of flip between topics of interest as long as that applies to your knowledge, as long as it's something you're passionate about, then that's exactly what you should do. And the other thing is there's things that will come to be a particular mountain for you. And they might feel insurmountable at the time. Examples of things I'm still too scared to do, blind ignite talks. That's where you don't have the slides. And it's basically a slide flips through on a regular rate. And you basically do a talk as the slides are flipping through and try and relate a message back. I am still not brave enough to do a blind ignite. I'll let you know if I ever make it there, but I haven't at the moment. But one of the ones in particular I found was when I thought I was going to just stay and do all the, the, the kind of online stuff. I'm like, I can't do in person. It's too much. And I got the best advice ever from my wonderful friend, Helen Scott. It's applicable to so many domains. Just hit the submit button and run away. So you agonize over that abstract for a talk to talk to outline your topic. You think it's perfect, but you're still not sure if you want to submit, you're still not comfortable, you're feeling nervous and uncomfortable, you just hit the submit button, you run away, you make a cup of tea, well, at least I do, I make a cup of tea and I just sit and I relax because it's done. There's nothing I can do about it. Sometimes you need to go out your comfort zone and I'm lucky that Helen made me go out of mine because see if she hadn't told me this, this photo wouldn't exist. I wouldn't have got the chance to speak at DevOps UK. And that's the power of the community that I built through those communities I talked about before. You connect with people, you support each other. And that's what helps you to just keep swimming. I'm sorry to mix up the fish metaphor with the savannah, but you just keep going, you keep swimming, you keep running. And then you'll end up getting to that situation where you know, you'll know you be speaking at a major conference, just like I did. You might be wondering why, why bother? Um, you know, what kind of opportunities is this going to give me if I do speaking? It's a great thing to do in terms of sharing knowledge. We've covered that in terms of the mentorship angle. But why? Why, why do speaking? Reality is, actually, speaking gave me a lot of really cool opportunities, things that I would never have got to do. I had the opportunity to collaborate on InfoQ articles because people would reach out after a conference talk I'd given and say, do you want to collaborate on a piece? I got the opportunity to do podcasts. I got to do a experience report for the Agile Alliance because I submitted their experience track and got accepted. I got to share my, my journey through investment banking tech, all that fun stuff. And also, I got this job. You don't need to be an advocate to speak at a tech company. You can be an engineer, you can be absolutely anyone at all. But I was enjoying this a lot. These kinds of things was becoming way more exciting than writing code in the same bank that I'd written code for, for just about 10 years. So a friend said to me, why don't you apply for advocacy jobs? I think it would fit. I think you'd be good. Um, but I kept saying, oh, no, I've not got I've not got these technologies, which are listed in this spec. I've not got this many years experience in developer advocacy. I'm not sure I can uh, commit to traveling so much because I've got a young son. All these kind of different setbacks and, and kind of niggles started forming in my head. And I got the same advice twice. 
just hit the submit button and run away, which is what I did with the job application for Elastic. And we all know how that worked out, didn't we? So the reality is, when it comes to public speaking, it's a wonderful thing. It's a fun thing. You are never going to get over the nerves. It can give you fantastic opportunities. And even after that, you are going to have setbacks. I still, right now, even though I am comfortable, I still have nerves in my stomach. That never goes away. That just says to me that I know I want, I care about this topic and I want to do a good talk. I've had issues galore where I feel like I've wanted to give up. Like the first time that I had a technical failure, I bought a new clicker the second time I went to DevOps UK and it was interfering with the equipment. So I had no clicker and I had to point at things code snippets on my screen so I was doing this kind of dance uh, the cameraman hated me because I was basically dancing around between pointing at things and moving my slides using my keyboard on my laptop not great there was a time I had the coughing fit um that was not great and that is exactly why every time I do a talk I have to have a cup of tea so I don't get a coughing fit I've had all sorts of setbacks and every single one has made me feel like a gazelle. It's made me want to hide in the corner, run away, and just not continue speaking. But the reality is I just enjoy it too much. It's too much fun. There's so many benefits afforded with it. It doesn't matter. You're still a lion. If you keep going, you make those small incremental steps as you go along. You can get benefits. You can put to bed all those fears about your state of your knowledge, the usefulness of your experience, and you can probably help guide some people along the way. So I hope you found this maybe inspiring, maybe enlightening, maybe it's left you with tons of questions, maybe it's made you want to find out some of those resources I talked about. So I'm happy to take any questions either in the chat or if you want to come off mic, feel free. I'm also going to send these resources out afterwards in the chat. So these are the links to join aspiring women speakers and aspiring speakers. There's a couple of resources for finding open call for proposals. So if you want to submit to a conference and you're not sure which ones, these are good for finding them. I've got a blog that I wrote about what it was like moving from online to in-person speaking. And I've got a link to that video as well. So we can all have a giggle for uh, Deborah Francis White later talking about gazelles and lions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charlie. <laughs> wow, amazing talk. Very, very inspiring. Mm -hmm. Very happy to be here and to learn from you. I'm pretty much uh, sure that everybody has enjoyed and learned a lot. Uh, so I guess now we have uh, some time for questions. Does anyone have a question? You can drop to the channel or if you want to, to ask right away, you can uh, raise your hand. Just feel free. If not, I can start asking a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, Rachel, you can go, please. Thank you. Um, thanks, Carly. That was a really amazing talk. I, I really enjoyed it. And I really love the way that you just use quite simple pictures in the background that just <laughs> you feel really calm <laughs> um, thank watching you. your talk and um, yeah, getting introduced to tech speaking. So thank you. I think what struck me during um, your talk, one of the main things that comes up in my mind is you had lots of great reasons for saying yes and why it's good mm -hmm. to say yes to the talk. But uh -huh. I wondered in your um, years now of experience, mm -hmm. how how do you know when to say no? How, how do you know when to kind of take a step back? Maybe mm -hmm. be the elephant that's watching the gazelle and watching the <laughs> and I love the analogy. <laughs> I love the analogy of the elephant. Um, that's a really good question. I think there's two edges to it. There's either the general idea of, you know, going on this big, long journey, and there might be points when you need to take a break. Um, and then the second one is that, oh, that's kind of lost. So we'll focus on the first one first. So one of the things that I had more on my maternity leave was that idea of you know I kept pushing myself on and pushing myself on thinking I needed I always was on the go 
And I think sometimes to a fault for me personally, I don't know about others, but I will just keep going despite, and that's actually probably the wrong tactic. I think it's important sometimes to just acknowledge that maybe it's not the right time and maybe there's things that you're doing that are more important right now. So for example, when it had come up before, much of the reasons for saying no to doing conference speaking at that time was, you know, the niggles around don't have anything interesting to say and all that, all that kind of fear. But actually there was partially a practical element at that time. The time that this advice was given to me, I'd just gotten promoted. And when you get promoted, commonly in banking, it's a situation where you get loaded with a ton of, even though you're promoted and you're meant to be running at that, that speed, you get tons of extra responsibilities thrown at you. You normally get a change of project, which I had to within the space of a few months because there had been dynamic changes. And I also ended up having to start managing people for the first time, which was terrifying. So the idea of people being very breakable, um, that you're responsible for their career. If I'd taken this on at that time, I think I would have burnt out. And that's the other thing that juggling this with other stuff takes a lot of energy. So one of the things I'd be mindful of for saying no is say no when you think it's going to be too much or there's something more important to you at that time. Because as I said, it's never too late. You can always come back to it. Um, it's not like you're going to miss your shot and that's it. The second point on that as well is saying no to opportunities. I am really bad at that as well. And one of the things I've had to learn is that you need to say no, either if it's something that maybe doesn't fit. So if it just feels like you're pushing through for the sake of pushing through, maybe the, the topic or something is not authentic, or maybe you've just got too much on, that you still want to try and take that additional podcast recording, that additional article. That's the point when it's, when it's too much and you just can't fit it in. That's the time to say no as well. So there's two points where you should really say no. Does that answer your question, Rachel? Yeah, for sure. That's that's really good advice. Thanks for sharing that. No worries. Lizzie, you got a question? That was fabulous. Thank you. Yeah, mine is actually about fees and money from both sides, from people, um, from your experience of kind of what you charge, particularly for meetups. We're looking, we're a new tech, uh, deep tech mm -hmm. database and looking to yeah. hold talks in London and with mm -hmm. speakers and I've been having yep. lots of conversations with people saying actually we need to be looking at paying speakers at meetups because of accessibility you know sometimes mm -hmm. people women are paying for childcare or they've got other responsibilities that they need to look mm -hmm. at so I'd, yep. I'd love to get your yeah your thoughts and advice on that. So as a developer advocate I because this is part of my job doing meetups and things I don't tend to charge and when I do tech conferences, quite often there might be things like they might often they'll cover travel expenses. But I know this is a really contentious topic about paying speakers for their time. I've seen, um, so I saw someone speaking about it at an LGC thing probably a couple of years ago now, and they were adamant that we needed to start paying speakers. And it's really, it's a really tricky one. Um, I think what the way I've seen it done is I've been offered payment a couple of times for my time. Um, it depends on the conference. But normally what I would do is there's a couple of things. Some people might not be able to take it because it's part of their, their job conditions. And in that case, if you still want to give them some sort of financial and it's not covering travel, you could offer to make a donation to a charity of their choice for the, the particular sum. That's certainly something that I would consider, or you could ask them if they want to donate it back to the organization that's running the meetups as well. That's another thing to think about. Um, you can also, because you're talking about meetups and you're probably trying to find, we're similar, we run a meetup in London for Elastic, you're trying to find hosts and you're trying to find money for drinks and things, and you're trying to find speakers as well. Um, I'd rec one of the things that we've been doing is reaching out to companies if they want to ask for, you know, if they're willing to host us, but then also if they want to put a speaker forward for covering 
how they use the particular features and giving them that spot to showcase themselves as a company is another way to potentially go around it. And then you can have the conversation about potential budget constraints as well. Um, I hope that helps. It's a really contentious topic. I know some people think we should be paying speakers for their time, but it also has tax implications for some speakers as well, if you're PAYE, for example. Um, so I would say take it on a per speaker basis and consider other alternative options, whether they want to donate their time, whether they don't want to and they want to take a fee, it's totally up to the individual. So I'd suggest maybe set out some guidelines of how you want to approach it as a community and, and have that conversation on a per speaker basis. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And if I can help in any other way afterwards, let me know, Lizzie. You can reach out after. Does anyone cool. has another question? I have one. I can shoot. Let's see if someone else shoots another one. But for me, uh, so you really talk a lot about uh, how you love doing that. And you realize mm -hmm. that the, 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 the hardness is it's worth it because you do love that. But uh, if I think about, let's say, I, I don't know if I love that and if yeah. I like that, but what would be the other game on doing that that you notice as well in your tech career? For example, I, I do imagine that this can support you uh, talking about presentations and during your day-to-day -day work. So can you maybe describe it a bit uh, on the other way around how this helps you in your work on the tech space, for example? Yeah, so I guess the key thing firstly is, is visibility. So doing tech speaking probably makes you stand out because as an industry, not many of us actually want to stand up on a stage and speak, particularly engineers. And I, I know from experience that actually we want engineers to speak and share about the cool things that they're doing. Um, certainly as part of the, the stuff I do at Elastic, we also want to make sure that engineers are supported. So we do help with encouraging them to submit to conferences, not just because it works for their own career visibility. These are things that quite often are considered um, attributes getting towards the more senior levels of individual contributor tracks. So if you're wanting to try and go up towards um, you know, principal or distinguished engineer, often contribution back to the community is a factor that a lot of people don't realise they have to do. So for general career, career progression, it's definitely one thing that you know you need to think about. I get sometimes people just totally hate it. They might do um, certain uh, kind of sessions and that's it. But there is a there is actually a surprising adrenaline when you come off because think about it, you are in effectively flight or flight mode at that point in time. So there is actually a source of adrenaline from when you finish a talk that you have this nice kind of feeling of positivity when you finish, even in the instances when you come off and it's not quite went to plan. So that's certainly a, another reason to do it as well. But the other thing is that there's other aspects of your job where you might not think it's public speaking, such as the, the kind of sprint review stuff I was talking about, but it, it is, or it might be that you have to do things like when you get to a more kind of senior engineering level that maybe you have to do more in terms of giving presentations to developers. Maybe you need to teach them about particular technologies. It's a skill that we tend to underrate but it's something that actually, as we progress in our career, we need to be able to do more comfortably. You don't need to be the most amazing, most charismatic speaker in the world, but if you can formulate you know, a path of the, the structure of the content you're gonna show in those kinds of sessions, um, that's going to make for a more engaging session. It means that the people you're passing the knowledge onto are probably more likely to retain it as well. So it's something that is woven very subtly through our jobs. Um, I mean, you still hate it, but the more you do it, the easier it gets. So I don't have the situations necessarily where, you know, I've got the quaking knees like I did in my first lightning talk. Um, but certainly um, as I've done more of it, it gets easier. And actually your fear ebbs away because you realize that all those things in your head that are the worst possible thing that could ever happen and um, that actually, you know what, it's not the, big, the biggest thing in the world that that happened. So the only way actually to counteract the fear is to keep doing it as the other, the other thing as well. Does that answer your question, Adriana? Yes, yes, thank you a lot. <laughs> 
So do we have any other questions? And so if don't, I want to thank you, Carly, a lot uh, for your time, for your amazing talk and very inspiring for sure. And I also encourage everyone here uh, to present or to come up with uh, our group proposing ideas for talk because we do need more people. We need more volunteers. And if you want to give a try, you can suggest a talk, come to us. And we do have a lot of topics that will need help. Please come. And yes, thank you, everyone. And thank you, especially you, Carly. Yeah, See you around, guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.